On this episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, the sinking of the SS Eastland steamship, one of the worst nautical disasters in American history. But the scene was so terrible because it was a situation where people were drowning all at the same time and men were grabbing a hold of women and pulling them down, trying to float on them. Most of the people who died got trapped at a stairwell inside the ship. Everybody had to go up the one single stairwell from deck to deck. And as they all tried to get up the same stairwell when the boat tipped over and was on its side, uh, two big problems. Number one, a stairwell on its side now has the treads going up and down, so there's nothing to grab onto. And secondly, as everybody tried to get up the staircase, which is now sideways and can't, they pile up t- together. And most of the bodies were found right at that single spot. It was a choke point. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Great to have you here, as always. I am so pleased to have as my guest today Michael McCarthy. He worked as both a reporter and an editor at the Wall Street Journal for 22 years. And he is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Ashes Underwater, the SS Eastland and the shipwreck that shook America. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Eric, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah. So I was bumming around downtown Chicago in in 2008 when I happened to stumble upon a plaque along the Chicago River remembering this terrible tragedy. And it was the the first I'd heard about it. Um, How about you? Uh, when did you first learn about this, and how did your interest in the story transition into a decision to write a full-blown book? So, yeah, that's a good question. So I, I spent, um, as you said, 22 years at the Wall Street Journal, and it was a little over a decade ago when I was having dinner in Chicago with a fellow reporter who we looked down at the river, and he said, did you know that a large steamship capsized right there? in the early 1900s. And I said, no, I I never even heard of that. And he said, and not just that, but more passengers died on that steamship than on the Titanic. And I just thought that's stunning. How how could I not have known that? I worked in Chicago for about a decade and it had never come up. So I started looking into it and there were a book or two on it. But what I found was that I had discovered one of the most deadly, least known shipwrecks in America. It was a tale so horrible and so surprising. I couldn't let it go. And in many ways, it wouldn't let me go. So let's start with the steamship Eastland. Prior to the disaster, it had a pretty storied history. Uh, would, Would you talk about its construction and the journey it took before landing into the hands of Walter Steele? Absolutely. So the the ship was built in Michigan in the early 1900s, 1902, and delivered in 1903. Um, it was 275 feet long, and its beam, or its width at the center, was 38 feet. So we're talking about something that is about as long as a football field. And it was in July of 1915. Um, it was a Saturday, a misty, rainy Saturday in Chicago, downtown. And this very large steamship quickly capsized. And the thing that just puzzled me beyond belief was it was tied to its dock when it capsized. Now, I'm a sailor. I learned to sail on Lake Michigan. I know how boats behave. And so if the thing were tied up and it still managed to capsize, then someone surely did something wrong. And yet, looking into the history, no one was ever found responsible. That's where I began. I said, something clearly went wrong. Someone did something wrong. And I am going to stay with it till I figure that out. So 
again, we're, we're down at the Riverside in Chicago. There are skyscrapers, but skyscrapers in 1915 are only about eight, 10 stories high in Chicago, uh, but right in the center of town. And all of a sudden, this ship starts to twist away from the dock. The lines that are holding it in place snap. And we're talking lines that are four inches thick snap and the whole thing goes over. In a course of minutes, 844 people died. That's 22 entire families. And as I mentioned before, that's more passengers than on the Titanic. There were 832 passengers who died on the Titanic, a good number more crew, but a significant number of people. And so many people were in Chicago, these were mostly Chicagoans, that with 844 people perishing in a single morning, the entire architecture of family trees was changed. Grandmothers, aunts, children, uncles, fathers, whole families just decimated. Now, this is in the center of Chicago, downtown, 19 feet from busy streets. The shore was only 19 feet away. People were throwing chicken crates, literally anything they could find that would float to try and help these people jumping in. And most of them were women and children. 1915, we're talking ankle length dresses on the women, large, beautiful uh, hats, children in strollers, children in, in you know lacy outfits. Uh, many of them didn't know how to swim. Most were poor and they simply quickly drowned in, in an incredible mass drowning. And so I spent 10 years researching this. It was a, it was a national tragedy. And, and what I found along the way was a story of, of tragedy and neglect and, and mystery. And until my book, we had no reasonable explanation of what happened. So the boat was first constructed for a very specific purpose in a very specific town. And it was also built for speed. Its owners needed the boat to go at, at a minimum 20 miles per hour in the water, right? Yes, exactly. So so this was built for the city of South Haven, which is about two hours drive now from Michigan, from uh, Chicago. And um, South Haven already had a large steamship. It was called the city of South Haven. It was not unusual for cities to have their own ships and they would run back and forth between Chicago. It was one dollar round trip. It was about a three hour tour, depending on, you know, conditions and so forth. So what the what the business owners in the city of South Haven wanted to do was compete with the existing ship for that town over to Chicago. Now, remember, we're talking about early 1900 Chicago. Chicago is a dirty, dusty place. It's miserable in the summer. Forget air conditioning. There's no fresh wind. The, the Chicago River is a mess. People were really eager to get away, to go on vacation, to get to some beach time. And Michigan beckoned. It was right across the lake. So people would frequently get on these steamships. Again, we don't have radio. So in 1915, the classiest, most rich, most well-to-do people on earth, the people everybody emulated, were on steamships. They had these big, you know, luggage carts and so forth that they'd be taking on. And it just looked like they were kings. So everyone wanted to emulate that. And that's that's why this steamship business was becoming very uh, lucrative. So the owners, the, the potential owners in South Haven, Michigan, order up another boat. But they say, you know, in order for us to have a good marketing pitch, a good way to compete with the existing city of South Haven, we gotta we have to have something that's faster. So if you go to the National Archives, there is a five page contract. It's, it's kind of hilarious to think about now. This is a two hundred and thirty five thousand dollar ship that was the uh, purchase price. It was only five pages <laughs> for the contract. And half of those pages, half of the five had to do with being sure it was as fast as possible. And they had a speed of at least 19 miles an hour contractually. Now, when the ship was built, if it didn't make 19 miles an hour, they were contractually allowed to walk away from the deal. So my point is what they had in mind, what their biggest concern was, was the speed of the ship. They did not seem to have safety in mind from its inception. For someone boarding the ship um, on an excursion, what would they have encountered on board? What were some of the amenities? 
Yeah, so you step aboard, and it's basically three passenger decks. You get on uh, the, the lowest deck, you climb up, and there's some cabins. There's actually staterooms and cabins. They were they were minimal, but they were, you know, appointed cabins with uh, nice beds and so forth. And um, there was a bar. There was a dance floor. They had different kinds of, you know, concession stands, beers, uh, hamburgers, you know, were sort of spitting on the grill. There was full bar. And then above that deck was the promenade deck, which you could walk around. And, you know, if, if you think of the Titanic and you think of that movie, this is a ship that's really sort of like that. It was really spectacular in its time for what it was. And so, you know, passengers were um, were really bowled over when they went on. And in fact, I, I deal with in the book the, the fact that... Uh, over time, the Chicago authorities became convinced that there was what they called vice, vice happening on the ship. So they, they sent these undercover cops and indeed what they found was that, you know, children were drinking beer and men and women were going into the staterooms and staying for a mysteriously long time and then coming out and then another man would go in and so forth. So, you know, part of that, part of that is dealt with in the book. It was a very, um, kind of crazy time on these steamships. Uh, in Chicago, and we we can't really um, even imagine the the steamship experience back then because remember, the railroad existed, but the car really hasn't come on yet. So this is a very sort of short time frame in which the um, the steamship experience was one that was of great extravagance and great um, mystery, and people just enjoying themselves in a way that they couldn't in their day to day lives. One of the most unique features of the ship was a calliope that sat on top and blasted <laughs> this incredible music. Right. So, so again, you know, it's funny for us to think about, um, you know, there's really almost no way to advertise. There's no way to make yourself sound better than your competitor back then. So what do you do? Well, you make a whole bunch of noise. <laughs> so as the thing, as the Eastland is going up and down shorelines, it would play this, this massive calliope. It was a, a steam based organ and they would play all kinds of hits from the time, you know, all the songs that would have been on people's mind. People would be tapping their toes as, as this thing's being played. And we almost can't imagine it now. As somebody's playing the, the keyboard, there are pipes and it's it's like the, the steam is blasting out of these pipes and, and very high pitched. And it's, it's like a tea kettle going off all the time. Uh, the thing was massively loud. It was so loud, in fact, that the city of Chicago at one point banned its use in the town because uh, every time it would go through town, people would stop their work and go to the windows to go see what all the commotion was. And so the bosses got mad that their employees were so distracted by the Eastland that that they uh, prevailed upon the police to to stop them. So it was a, it was a very effective promotion for the ship. Interesting. So, so how about the machinery, the structure of the ship? Um, a part of what made it relatively unique when it was constructed was a double hull, right? Right. Yeah. So again, if you remember, we with with the Titanic, it's the same same sort of construction. The idea being that if you breach the hull, if you run into something, it's possible for one compartment to fill with water. But then you have a second airtight compartment that protects you. It's it's a it's a sort of a double redundancy that's aimed at safety. Um, the Eastland had the same sort of thing, and it was built with compartments inside its hull at the very bottom uh, for what was called ballast. The ballast is just a simple term that sailors use to refer to weight weight inside the ship. The thing with the Eastland though is that. The Eastland was moving from shoreline to shoreline, and there were all kinds of sandbars and other obstructions that were fairly high up in the water. So what the Eastland owners, potential owners, asked for when the ship was constructed was to come up with some way that they could elevate, raise the ship up, and lower it almost at will so that they could get around these obstructions. And the problem was that the system that was used by the Jenks Shipbuilding Company, which is uh, the original builder of the ship, the problem was that they were a 
a freight ship maker, not a passenger ship maker, and they used a bow system, a sort of water-based hydraulic system that works extremely well on a cargo ship, but not very well at all on a passenger ship. And because of decisions that they made, inadequate piping and horrible plumbing, it was certain that the Eastland was going to sink sometime, somewhere. So before the Eastland sunk, it had issues mechanically and financially, and it changed ownership multiple times. It did. So if we go back to 1904, the ship is only one year one year old at this point. It's uh, it's a July a Sunday in 1904. It's a little after six in the evening. There were almost 2,300 passengers aboard. Most were postal employees. People like to take. Uh, almost company vacations on these things. Well, it, the ship is just outside South Haven, Michigan, and it starts seesawing. It just starts turning from side to side. And all of a sudden it stops on one of its turns and is just leaning in the water. Well, people are screaming, women and men are grabbing for life preservers and strapping them on. And at one point someone yells, for God's sakes, Captain, turn back. Think of the women and children. And the response from the captain and the crew was they went and got a fire hose. They got a fire hose and sprayed the people with it until they went downstairs back into the ship so that they could get more stability. With everybody afraid it was going to tip over, they went to the top of the ship, which made it less stable. And the real reality is that by forcing them down, they were in much graver danger if the thing did tip over and eventually sink. So that's 1904, right? So in 1909, just five years later, and the ship is just a few years, only about six years old at this point, outside of Cleveland, same sort of thing happens. The ship begins to tip, begins to tip, and suddenly straightens it up. And people are so nervous. One guy got off at Cleveland and took a, a train back to Chicago. So Within two years, within two different incidents, there was evidence that this ship was very unstable. But, Eric, you make a really good point. One of the things, one of the reasons that the Eastland disaster happened is because it shifted owners. It moved from originally on Lake Michigan out to Lake Erie. And so one incident happened on Lake Michigan. They move it out to Lake Erie. No one knows about the previous one in Lake Michigan. After the Lake Erie near incident, near disaster happens, they move it back and people didn't know about that one. So they're doing almost this shell game of moving it around. And again, clearly pre-internet, pre-television, pre-radio, the information couldn't keep up with the near disasters that this ship was was sort of leaving in its wake. And eventually it, it made its way into the hands of Walter Steele, who was just barely able to finance the purchase of it, right? Yeah, it, it's it's one of those incredible ironies. You, you're watching as we know because of the book jacket that the thing sinks, right? But here he is sitting in St. Joe, Michigan, dying to get this boat, saying, I can get it for a steal. He doesn't understand he can get it for a steal because it has a horrendous reputation and is a, is a flawed vehicle. And and he he is advertising to people in town, hey, um, this is important to our town. We, we, you know, our future will be set by owning Eastland. And you're sitting there going, no, don't do it. But, you know, again, Benefit of hindsight and historical and so forth. But yeah, they were really going the wrong direction and they had to pull together a bunch, bunch of money from town. He, he was the largest investor himself, but he, um, rounded up financing and fundraising from, uh, people all over town and ended up buying the Eastland. And it was under their management within a year that the thing has its horrendous disaster. Yeah. So as you document the questionable adventures of the Eastland, you also write about the blossoming engineering career of a young Norwegian-American named Joseph Erickson, who plays a very important role in this story. Would you tell us about him? Absolutely. I, I love Joseph Erickson. He's, he's a hero in a story. It's hard to find one, in, to be honest. So if you go back 
Um, when I first started researching, I spent 10 years on this book. It, it is not a timetable I would recommend anyone do. But I'll tell you, part of the reason it took so long is because Joseph Erickson, who was the chief engineer on the Eastland, he was the guy who was in the bottom of the boat. He's in the engine room. He's the number two officer to the captain. And he, as the, as the boat is sinking, as he's tried everything he can think to try and save it, he stays at, at his post as the water is rising to his knees, to his chest, to his neck. And when it finally reaches the point where it's at his nose and he can't stay any longer to do anything mechanical to work to help prevent further disaster, he gets out of the ship. And then while some of the other crew dashed up out of the ship and escaped, swam to shore, got away, he stayed, got a rope, went below and helped tie up and bring people up to the surface who otherwise would have drowned. So he's a hero in so many ways. And I, I realize that, but I'll tell you what, the, the difficult thing about Joseph Erickson is that he was a relatively impoverished mariner. He uh, came from Norway. He had been in the U.S. for about six or seven years. He worked for the um, Army Corps of Engineers on some of their ships. He was a very skillful and skilled uh, engineer. But trying to find anything on him is impossible. It's not like he was a rich, well-to-do guy who wrote a memoir. I couldn't find, I couldn't find him. I couldn't find his family. And I just was convinced that the heart of the story resided in him. And, and so it took me years, years and years and years to actually find some distant relatives of him that had some very incredibly important information for the book. Oh, amazing. I love to hear those research stories. So uh, Erickson accepts employment on the Eastland. It wasn't his, his first choice, but he accepts the position because he wants to see his wife more. Exactly. And he meets Walter Steele. Can you tell us about their relationship and how they worked together to maintain the ship? Sure. So this is this really the, the meeting between Walter Steele and Joseph Erickson is the crux of my book. It's 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 the thing that we didn't know before that that was so important that we understand. It really is the story of the Eastland, the meeting between those two. And how did I learn about this? Well, I'm in the National Archives, the Chicago Regional Office, and I show up and this is very early on in the research. The year is probably 2000. And I go in and there are 12 boxes of materials, 12. <laughs> and it's it's a 1500 page trial transcript. It's blueprints of the ship. It's moorings and soundings of the Chicago River. It's an overwhelming amount of stuff. So I start looking through the the testimony uh, at the trial and I go, this is so much. I, I, I don't even know where to start. So I noticed a box of exhibits from the trial and I kind of opened it up and there are some photographs and and a few maps and so forth. They said, well, this seems more manageable. Let me just, you know, let me start here at least. Well, I don't know that I ever would have found what I did if I didn't go to that box. In that box was a signed confession from Joseph Erickson. It was a five page typewritten interview between Erickson and the Chicago chief of police. And I get chills thinking about it now because you can literally hold the bottom of the page and feel the depressions from the typewriter keys in it. It's, it's the copy that was made in the police chief's office. So what happened was the morning of, of Saturday, July 24th, 1915, right after the Eastland sinks, and there are hundreds of people who are drowning and, and, and die. The Chicago police arrest everyone connected with the ship. Everyone. The chef. They, 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 deckhands. They, they, they arrested everyone and questioned them all. They arrested the former captain too, right? Yes, they did. <laughs> who, who just happened to be driving by. Yeah, right. Yeah, they, exactly. They, 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 I mean, they, they were like, if you were connected with the Eastland, they just arrested you, right? So they round up everybody. Well, they've got Joseph Erickson. Joseph Erickson, 
who again he's our Norwegian guy. He's he's such a, a you know a good hearted person. He he he's pulled into the Chicago police chief's office and says you know we have to talk about what happened. Now what's what's fascinating about Charles Healy? He was the chief of police. He he, he was a mounted policeman who came up from from the ranks. Because he was a really skillful interviewer, he knew how to interrogate people really well. So he's got Erickson in his office, and for some reason, this Charles Healy, chief of police of Chicago, seemed to understand that this guy was going to hold the key to the whole puzzle, right? He, he Healy knew. And in a series of questions, none particularly brilliant, but all perfect, Joseph Erickson ends up telling him about a meeting that he and Walter Steele had on the Eastland about two months before the disaster. And in that meeting, there was a discussion of making specific repairs to the ship. They wanted to fix the Eastland's tendency to tip excessively. But then, as they discussed it, when Walter Steele, remember the top investor in the company, when he hears the cost and time involves, he decides to postpone the repairs. Six weeks later, the ship capsizes. Now, we haven't known this. We haven't known that the Eastland disaster might never have happened had the owners have followed through and fixed the stabilizing machi uh, machinery. So to me, this constitutes criminal negligence. There was strong evidence that the owners knew of a problem, planned to repair it, failed to fix it. And again, you may say, well, was an Erickson complicit. Here's what you need to understand here. Joseph Erickson had never sailed on the Eastland when he met with Walter Steele. He had just been hired. He was, the, the ship was at its dock in St. Joe. He was going over machinery, planning for the season. He had never ridden on it. So when Walter Steele says, can we make these repairs? He just doesn't mention a, the tendency of the ship to tip. He just says, would it be more efficient if we put these things in? So Erickson's completely in the dark and all the problems that surfaced happened in a single morning when he tried to salvage the ship. So one of the figures that authorities would immediately need to question was the, the, the current captain of the ship, Captain Peterson. I'm Norwegian American and, and I was really proud of how heroically Joseph Erickson handled himself as these uh, events unfolded, but also incredibly disappointed about Captain Peterson's actions. Would you share with us how he dealt with his sh ship sinking? He was a, again, a Norwegian sailor as well, but not nearly as competent as Joseph Erickson. In fact, he had hardly any experience on large passenger ships. He was in over his head from the beginning. He poorly managed the ship. He didn't pay attention to the ballast. He didn't give proper instructions to the crew over and over. He was really a problem. But I, what you're referring to is on the morning that this, the ship sank. First of all, he, he should have known based on its behavior, the seesawing behavior at the dock, that it wasn't safe to go out. It wasn't even safe to leave the dock. Yet, and, and he had an opportunity, many minutes, 15 minutes or so at least, to say, I don't feel good about this. We're getting everybody off the ship, right? That didn't happen. So the ship eventually tips over because he wasn't astute enough to see that the ship wasn't going to be able to make it away from the dock. He doesn't have the passengers disembark in an emergency. And then when it tips over, remember, this is a very large ship. It's it's tipped over. The Chicago River is only 19 feet deep at this point. So if it were deeper, the entire Eastland would have sank to the bottom. It, what it does, though, is it turns sideways and just stops. It just does a roll. It's a quarter of a roll. And then it just stops because the side of the ship is now on the bottom of the riverbed. So what this means is that there are people who are trapped inside the ship up in air pockets who are screaming, who are grabbing metal bars and pounding on it. They can hear the clatter of the metal underneath the hull so they know where people are. So people, rescuers, start getting 
torches and so forth to cut into the ship to like make holes. They say they were yelling to people stand back and they, they you know, have the, the, the sort of like firefly looking fire um, seams come through and the, the piece of metal would drop out and all of a sudden six, eight, ten people would be saved who wouldn't have been saved otherwise. Well, when the captain sees what's going on, he runs up to the rescuers, up to the, the, the people with the torch torches and says, don't do that. Stay away from the ship. You're ruining the property. <laughs> so he's showing more attention to the property of the ship, the property owners, than the people who are dying inside of it. He was really a bad character. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what makes this whole disaster beyond tragic into strange? Um, what was the spectacle of it all? Uh, there was no one to watch the Titanic sink, but here you had morning commuters uh, gawking as, as people drowned, people staring from office buildings, spectators throwing garbage to people in the river uh, for them to hopefully grab onto. And all the while, the Chicago River is, is flowing at eight miles an hour. So, so it's a fairly rapid current um, to drag people under. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that the the scene was absolutely ghastly. Uh, you know, um, there has been some film footage that that arose since I wrote my book, but unfortunately, it it shows the scene after the accident had already happened, and it's mostly rescue efforts. It's sadly uh, bodies, corpses being removed from the from the ship, but but the scene was so terrible because it was a situation where people were drowning all at the same time and men were grabbing a hold of women and pulling them down, trying to float on them. Most of the people who died got trapped at a stairwell inside the ship. Everybody had to go up the one single stairwell from deck to deck. And as they all tried to get up the same stairwell when the boat tipped over and was on its side, uh, two big problems. Number one, a stairwell on its side now has the treads going up and down, so there's nothing to grab onto. And secondly, as everybody tried to get up the staircase, which is now sideways and can't, they pile up t together. And most of the bodies were found right at that single spot. It was a choke point. And it's a very sad situation, too, because the people who died were mostly women and children. They they died gasping. <sighs> They were kicked bloody, they were choking on water, and that was their final moments. Yeah. Ugh. Also striking and shocking to me, some of the things that were happening as the boat was beginning to tilt on the deck, people were a bit more concerned, but in the hull, there was a dance floor and a band yes. that continued to play, and the young men and women dancing were having a blast slipping across the floor as the boat tilted. That's right. So, so as the thing is tipping and it, and it, it tilts and it holds at a certain angle, these are young people. They've got their straw hats on and their dresses and they're dancing. And all of a sudden they have this, it felt like, like a, you know, a merry-go-round or something, something at a, a theme park. And they were having fun with it. They didn't understand the peril. Many of the people have never been on a boat before, don't understand how they're supposed to behave and probably had in their mind the idea that surely if something were really wrong, they would have taken us off by now. And so the band is playing and um, the the violin players are trying not to tilt, tilt over in their chair. So they're digging their feet into the floor so that they can hold position and still keep playing. And then all of a sudden, in, in, a, in a moment, a, a refrigerator on board tips and it's filled with glass bottles of beer and the shattering made everyone an instant know things had turned disastrous. And of course, Water, cold water, by the way, cold and dirty water starts pouring in through through the windows and so forth. And um, the, the thing is filling up dramatically fast. And, and most people had no chance to get out. And the irony is that it tipped onto its port side, basically into the river away from the dock. So if you were on the right side, the starboard side of the boat, as you're looking forward, you were probably fine. In fact, some people who were on the starboard side simply reached around 
the outer portion of the ship and stood up as it ran, as it tipped over and they, they, they didn't even get wet and just walked off the boat. For those who were on the port side though, it was much more, it was impossible to get out. And there's another very sad note, which is that what happened that morning is that the morning began um, sort of beautifully. It was a muggy, muggy day. But as they were boarding, it started to drizzle and the drizzle got a little, a little harder. So the women, mothers, out of concern for their children getting wet in their play clothes and so forth, took them inside the ship and down to their staterooms to wait out the rain. And in many cases, that decision, that nurturing decision to keep them from getting wet ended up with their losing their lives. This was the Western Electric picnic outing. And many of the people on board were, were dressed in these incredible costumes in anticipation of a costume parade later that day. Exactly. So the plan was they were supposed to leave the Chicago dock uh, early in the morning, get over around lunchtime to the Michigan side. Um, actually, it was um, it's called Michigan City, but it's in the state of Indiana. It's a little bit of a misnomer. But um, they were going to a picnic ground and they were going to have um, barrel races and a beauty pageant and some film crews were going to be there. And back then, you know, the idea of being on a film was a really big deal. You know, there's a cameraman there. That was an event, um, you know, um, different types of food, um, parades. They had banners and all of that was set. That were, All of that was waiting for them to get there. So they were dressed in their very nice, gorgeous gowns. The men were in suit coats and, and straw hats and dress shoes. Everybody was there for a nice, beautiful day out at the beach uh, on the other side of, the, of Lake Michigan. And unfortunately, they never got there. You wrote that one of the people drowning in the river was a man dressed like Uncle Sam. It's just so hard to imagine how surreal it must all have been, just, just horrifically surreal. Yeah, so we, we basically have a river full of churning arms and screams, and you have baby strollers that are bobbing, and you know there's a child inside. There's rescuers who are jumping in. There's a little, there's a guy who is a little small, <laughs> diminutive man who they called the human frog. He is, uh, jumps into the water, rescues one person, brings them to shore, goes back in, gets another one. He was just this, this incredible, um, salvager. Um, and the scene on the docks was, was terrible. They would bring a body out. They, they, they suddenly had several hundred bodies laying on the docks in very, everybody's dressed in, in various states of, um, of life and death. And doctors are going around body to body, just doing a quick triage. And if they, if they think they can save the person, if they, they you know, they're, they're choking or they seem to be breathing, uh, there's evidence that they haven't died. They are yelling for what was called a pull motor, so like a lung machine that was supposed to sort of push air into their lungs and 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 resuscitate them. Um, and and in many cases, if if the person if it was clear to the doctor that the person simply couldn't be saved and 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 either was dead or was was certainly not going to make it, they would they would yell gone. They would just use a single word gone. So all over the docks, as panicked doctors and nurses are trying to get to people and save who can be saved and 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 pronounce on those who can't be, you're hearing gone, 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 shouted all over the place. So in the midst of all of this chaos, authorities almost immediately began trying to determine what had happened. But there were a lot of lies and misinformation to sort through in the aftermath of the sinking of the Eastland. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the things that makes the Eastland story hard is that there was a tremendous amount of information, some of it from the company. Um, the company advanced the theory that a boat passed by the Eastland on the riverside with a cameraman and the passengers on the top of the ship went over to that side to see the camera. Again, this is a 
The camera is a, a very new, it's a very much of a novelty at this time. People were fascinated with them. There isn't a Hollywood yet, but there are, there are the movie reels in the theaters and so forth. And so it's plausible that a camera in the river uh, floating by would have, would have drawn the attention. But, but what we know from witness testimony is that there was no ship with a camera on it. Um, and in fact, that's why we didn't have, we still don't have footage from the actual disaster. So, you know, there, there were attempts to put the blame on something other than the stability, the mechanical problems of the ship. So how does Clarence Darrow get involved in this case? So I mentioned before that Joseph Erickson has this conversation with the police chief in which he tells them, he, he lays out that the ship owners knew that there was a problem and failed to repair it. Well, that puts him obviously in hot water with the ship owners, his bosses, who basically say, all right, you know, fine, we're, we're cutting you off. We're not going to offer you any legal representation. They did, by the way, pay for a lawyer for the captain and some other people, including themselves, and they put together a a crack star, rock star sort of legal team to defend themselves, but they didn't allow Erickson to be part of the defense, right? So he's off on his own. He's virtually penniless. He's sitting in prison. Um, others had gotten um, bail and gotten out, some of the uh, executives of the company, um, but Erickson has no money. He, he manages to uh, finish up his time in jail. And before he goes to trial, He's he's sort of like trying to figure out what do I do? How, how am I going to you know, how can I defend myself? I have no money. And it dawns on him that Clarence Darrow, who's right there in Chicago, might want to take the case because he has favored the underdog in the past. And it's a it's an a incredible long shot gamble because, you know, Darrow is a upstanding, big, you know, high dollar attorney. But guess what? Darrow takes the case. <laughs> Darrow, in a very strange sort of valley of his career that is little known, had had some problems with bribery charges out in Los Angeles about the same time, comes back to Chicago, beats the bribery charges, but basically everybody knows that he did bribe a juror to try and throw a case to his favor. So he comes back pretty much a shambles. Nobody really wants him and he needs to rebuild his career. So he says, huh, here comes the Eastland disaster. It's been in all the nation's newspapers. I mean, I've looked at them. I've looked at them. <laughs> Every single newspaper all summer long had huge Eastland stories. The New York Times, the morning after the Eastland sank, three quarters of the page was nothing but the Eastland disaster. So this is a big national story. And Erickson figures out that, that Darrow will probably want it, again, a, a masterstroke of, of an idea, and Darrow needing some celebrity, something to pull him back into the limelight and resuscitate his career, takes the case. Do you think it's strange uh, that the company that owned the Eastland didn't retain an attorney for Joseph Erickson? Well, I mean, I think it... it it made them look bad, but for whatever reason, I, I don't know why they didn't, but it seemed to be vengeful. And they seemed to be cutting him off to let him twist in the wind. And they also tried to blame him in the end for you know mismanaging the ship. So I think that was part of it. But you know, what's fascinating to me, and, and one of the reasons it took me so long to do the book, just the same way I felt that that Joseph Erickson was the heart of the story. And I, I needed some personal correspondence. I really needed to put some flesh and blood on him because he was a real decent person. In a, in a story of not too much decency, he was a really good, uh, virtuous person. So I really, I felt that he deserved to be uh, fleshed out. Well, I sort of felt the same way about Darrow. And what's interesting is that Darrow had a, you know, incredible literature around him several biographies. He had an autobiography. He's showed up in so many different books. There have been movies, but nothing about the Eastland. Nothing. No, 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 there's not a word. So I thought, well, maybe in his autobiography, he wrote about the Eastland, but then took it out later. Why did I think this? Well, out at the National Archives in Washington are uh, records of Darrow's, 
um, papers, working papers and so forth. And there's a TypeScript of, his, you know, his edited copy of his autobiography. And there were parts of his story that he, for editing reasons, took out. So different events, different cases that he, he followed and worked on, um, he later took out. So I thought, well, maybe he wrote about the Eastland in his manuscript, but then edited it out later. No, <laughs> I looked all the way through. It wasn't there. I found all kinds of correspondence that he did. There's a, there is no shortage of Darrow uh, letters and um, correspondence between all kinds of famous people. Nothing. I can't find anything. There's, <laughs> there's just nothing. So I started wondering what what is it that, you know, why wouldn't Darrow have written about this? It was a really famous case. And he won, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, why why wouldn't you want to trumpet that? And I think the answer is, I don't like to speculate, but but it's all we have in this case because he didn't write about it. I think he felt that he did something dishonorable in helping the owners of the ship avoid criminal responsibility. He was effectively the representative for Joseph Erickson. And Joseph Erickson really was innocent. And Darrow's job was to get Erickson off. But because of the way the prosecutors constructed the charges, it was a conspiracy case. And what that meant is that Joseph Erickson, the ship owners, the captain, all had to be found guilty or all had to be found innocent. It was a group. It was a whole group. So Darrow's really incredibly brilliant work in defending Erickson ended up getting the innocent person off, but also got those who were guilty off as well. So he never talked about it. But, you know, it's funny. There's a connection. And if you like stories about you know, tenacity <laughs> in finding someone. I was convinced that Erickson and his his life was going to be important and need to be fleshed out. So I way back in the early 2000s, before the Internet is really even up and, and going, I take out classified ads in newspapers in Michigan because I'm trying to find out if anyone is related to Joseph Erickson. So I wrote to every Erickson in about six towns. 60 letters. I hear from no one except one. And he writes and says, and you know, I basically said, Joseph Erickson was on the Eastland. He was um, blamed, scapegoated for problems on the ship. I believe that's not what happened. I'd love if you're related to him to get in touch with me so that we can correct the record and, you know, vindicate him. And one, one guy, I forget his first name, but his last name is Erickson, writes to me and says, I'm not related to Joseph Erickson, but but your book sounds fascinating. Can't wait till it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's a point to this. I keep at it, and eventually I find a woman all the way out in Oregon who is a distant relative of Joseph Erickson's. I agree to go out and meet with her. And while I'm there, she shows me photographs of her relative, Joseph Erickson, which I had never seen before. And while we're looking over materials, she, we're sitting in Starbucks. And, and I remember I looked down and she's going through this file of paper that she, her family has had for, you know, 80 years. And honestly, she doesn't even know what's in there to, to, to speak of. And as I'm looking, I've looked at so much correspondence from D Clarence Darrow at this point that I know what his stationery looks like. And I look down and I see Clarence Darrow's stationery right there on the Starbucks table with this woman. And I look at it and I said, that's a letter from Clarence Darrow. <laughs> and she says, oh, is it? <laughs> she said, I, I'm like, yeah. So so I go, could could I? Could I see that, please? <laughs> and what I want to do is run out of the Starbucks with it, you know. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want to get, away, you know, I don't want to have her get away. And so I'm looking at it, and and I say to her, "Look, this is this is important material, and I'd really like to make copies if that's okay with you, and so forth." So she does. She she lets me make copies, and to this day, it is the only only thing anyone has ever found in which Clarence Darrow references the Eastland case. And what it was, was he was writing to the widow of Joseph Erickson, 
This is in 1916. Joseph Erickson, spoiler alert, does die shortly after the accident. Causes unrelated. But um, he's writing a letter of condolence to her about her husband and talking about why he represented him in the case and, and that it was that it was shameful that he was ever charged. Well, no one is no one has had any of this. So my my gut feeling that pursuing correspondence, something that fleshed out Joseph Erickson, led me to the only piece of paper that exists, to my knowledge, in which in which Clarence Darrow, the famous, you know, famous <laughs> Scopes Monkey Trial Clarence Darrow, pours his heart out to the widow of this character in my book. Wow, that's amazing. So what was Darrow's strategy in defending Joseph Erickson? Yeah, so <laughs> he he is really shrewd. <laughs> Clarence Darrow is really shrewd. Basically, I know this from from a previous trial that he did. He when when there's pretty good evidence of guilt, he points the finger at something else. It's like, hey, pay no attention to that. Look at this thing over here, right? So what he does is he says, you know, the the puzzling thing about the Eastland and the thing that that got me really intrigued with it was that it seesawed. It seesawed at its dock, right? So it begins. It's sitting at the dock. It's tied up, as I've mentioned. It turns toward the dock. It's, you know, it sort of like rolls toward the dock and stays there. And inside the ship, Joseph Erickson is attempting to right it, you know, by, by admitting water into the opposite side. And he does straighten it up. But then it turns to the river side again, right? So he admits water to the other side and straightens it up. And then it begins to tip again. So this is, <laughs> it's back and forth and back and forth. So the question is, what would cause that? And this is what the judge has to be convinced of. What caused it was this horrible piping that I talked about, in inadequate uh, plumbing. So what the Eastland was doing basically was it was doing something like a partial sinking. It was a controlled sinking. It was emitting water. And then it was moving it around within tanks below so that it could actually make the ship do what it needed to rise a little bit on the left side, rise a little bit on the right side, so forth. Darrow says, I need a different explanation because I can't have the ship mechanics guilty or I lose the case. So he says, you know what? You know what I think? I think the ship was was sitting on something that there must have been a piling, a post, a column underwater that no one knew was there. And so as the ship was on top of it, of course, it would teeter on the top of this post. And he hires a diver to go down into the water under, underneath where the Eastland was berthed at the time and saws this thing off. He has the diver theatrically haul this piece of wood into the courtroom and say, yeah, this is what I found. And so what Darrow is doing is he's attempting to set up a an alternate explanation, right? In in reality, further testimony showed that that there was at least six to eight feet of water below where that post was. So it was complete nonsense. It was a it was a you know a nice piece of evidence to bring in, but there's no way, there was no way that that post was high enough for the Eastland to be teetering on it. So once that failed, he began sort of tap dancing around and undermining the prosecution case at every turn, um, questioning, you know, tripping up their expert witnesses and giving the judge sufficient doubt around the prosecution case. So he really just outsmarted the prosecution. The prosecution was the U.S. government. These are federal prosecutors. Some were in from Washington. Some were from Chicago. But they were just outgunned in this in this trial. So being an expert on this topic and knowing the ins and outs of this so well, have you ever imagined what might have happened if, if the Eastland had actually cleared the Chicago River and, and made it out onto Lake Michigan? So... There are 2,500 passengers on board. Probably all of them would have died. 
um, you know, Lake Michigan can go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 feet, depending on where you are. And the entire ship would have would have gone under. It's the, it was a 2,000 ton weight ship. All it's going to do is go down once it starts filling up with water. And you know there would have been no opportunity for rescues. I mean, remember one of the one of the advantages to the Eastland sinking where it was was that while it's surprising how many people died, they were able to rescue quite a number. And remember too, they were able to get medical staff in there pretty quickly because they're in the middle of a city. So had you know had the Eastland have sunk in deeper water the the loss of life would have been at least double what it actually was instead of 844 it would have been 2500 people and, you know i did an interview once where there was there was some thought that the eastland was overloaded there were licensing regulations and they they said um you know how many people can safely travel on the ship and they, they were licensed to carry 2,500 passengers, 2,500 passengers and about 100 crew. And somebody said to me, you know, was that a safe number? And my response was, when I thought about it, the Eastland, as constructed, was not safe with a passenger load of one. Yeah, good, good point. So what safety precautions did a ship like the Eastland take? Uh, I mean, we all know that Titanic had lifeboats. What about the Eastland? Right. So they had they had lifeboats and they did have life preservers. And there should have been enough emergency equipment to save everyone. Um, but again, in a sinking of this nature, it would have been so quick. I don't know that anyone could have gotten to the equipment that they would need or the lifeboats. I mean, there probably would have been some salvage that could have happened, but but, you know, the Eastland, when it tipped, I think it filled up within a minute or so, 30, 30 seconds, a minute. And again, most of the people were below. In this case, they were in their cabins and trapped as they tried to get up the stairwell. So, you know, um, it is advantageous when a ship sinks slowly that people have time to prepare. But when it's when it when it goes over quickly, um, no matter what sort of life preservers and boats you have in place, it's going to be a very risky and difficult proposition to save many of the people. And steamships were fairly unsafe during this time. You write in your book, many accounts of them having accidents, including the famous Christmas ship, which, which brought the Christmas trees to Chicago. That, that's right. And, and, you know, one of the reasons that I talk about Joseph Erickson being a hero is there was something, and I spent some time in my book talking about um, what's called boiler explosions. So, you know, if you think about it, what a steamship is doing is kind of like a tea kettle under the water, and it's it's uh, superheated water that's going through piping, and it's churning um, different um, gears and so forth that are turning propellers, right? So it's this, this whole setup that's all based on super high-pressure hydraulics. Well, Around the time of Mark Twain, uh, Civil War era and so forth, there were a tremendous number of catastrophic boiler explosions in which these things would, would – if a ship began to tip or water got in near them, they were so hot that the metal would fail and the, the tank, this superheated water tank, would blow up. It would go in all directions and they would literally find body parts from people – half a mile away. I mean, the, the, you know, forks would, would twist and burn and fuse together. Um, they would find in wreckage, um, tremendous, tremendous, um, damage, tremendous energy that's released in these explosions. So when, when the Eastland goes over, one of the reasons I talked about Erickson staying at his post so long while the water almost drowned him, and in fact, chilling detail, he, he was wearing a watch and the watch stopped at the exact moment that this, the ship sank. It just was waterlogged and, and his watch stopped, but he didn't. Well, what he did, he was fully aware of the danger of the cold Chicago water hitting those burning tanks and hitting it very quickly. So it's, it's that combination of superheated boiling tanks suddenly splashed with cold water that causes the metal to just blow up. 
So he decides my tanks are in danger. And if they blow, there'll be hundreds more people that die. So rather than getting out of that ship with that, that danger, that possibility, he stays in place and slowly starts letting water into the tanks to lower their temperature so that he's, he's basically bringing down a complete bomb hazard. He's detonating the possibility of these things blowing up. And so when the water actually does hit them, he's cooled them down enough that they don't blow, that the metal won't fail, and there won't be this catastrophic explosion that probably would have killed hundreds more people. And this is, this is an incredible presence of mind on his part. He knew how dangerous these things were, and he, he kept in his place, at his post, took that danger away, and as soon as he was sure it was it was alleviated that that bomb had been detonated and he couldn't stay any longer. That's when he left the ship. And by the way, as I pointed out, returned <laughs> through through these little portholes, you know, the round sort of circular windows that are on boats. Sure. Yeah. This thing's about 14 inches wide. And the guy's so small. They called him slim. He's this diminutive little man. He's so small. He slips through the little round porthole down with a rope over his shoulder and starts rescuing some children who were trapped below. Wow. What a hero. In fact, he continued rescuing until the police arrested him. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> Well, well, this has just been great. So you have a website dedicated to this book. Um, if you could share that with us, and then yes. you have another disaster-related history book coming out in September, and I'm hoping you can give us a little preview on that. Yeah, sure. So the, um, the, the website is Ashes Underwater for the current book that we're talking about, and um, it has information, uh, reviews, and, and other things. If you want to reach me, email me. It's got that sort of thing. And um, uh, the new book is is about the Hindenburg disaster. Um, it's a a similar sort of approach that I took. I, I um, reviewed records in Germany and in uh, the United States, the National Archives, and I found the reason that the Hindenburg blew up, which no one has known before. We we knew that there was um, some re for some reason there was hydrogen that was leaking from this famous ship, this Zeppelin, that was over New Jersey in 1937 and caught fire and the whole thing was destroyed in 30 seconds. But why? Why why the leak? Well, I found I found out why there was a leak. <laughs> and so the book goes into that and uh, talks a little bit about incredible misinformation on the part of the people who built the Zeppelin and operated it. And the structural problems with the ship were purposely hid. And the book, The Hidden Hindenburg is what it's called, uh, which comes out in September, will reveal all of that for the first time. Oh, that's tantalizing. <laughs> <laughs> it should be fun. Hopefully we can set up a time to have you back and coordinate it with the release of your new book. Yeah, that'd be great. I also, I'm, we're going to have a website, thehiddenhindenburg.com, and on that I have a three-episode um, sort of podcast, sort of, um, you almost call it like a movie reel, the old radio show, where I have uh, some voices of the Zeppelin captains and some of the newsreels back then from the disaster, and I'm talking about over the three episodes, it's about an hour and ten minutes, um, basically how, how I discovered, uh, the cause of the disaster. Oh, excellent. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I really enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed that project. And, um, you know, if you remember the, the, the famous newscaster who's, you know, shouting from the field, oh, the humanity and everything, this was really a radio story, the Hindenburg. It was something that, that played out over the radio. And so to, to return in a podcast form feels very, um, full circle somehow. Yeah, for sure. I uh, can't wait to hear it. Well, well, this has been marvelous. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. Okay, Eric. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Again, I have been speaking to Michael McCarthy. He is the author of Ashes Underwater, the SS Eastland and the Shipwreck that Shook America. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast 
broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.